Hi, everyone. My name is Annie Rogers, and on behalf of the Attitude team, I'm pleased to welcome you to today's ADHD Experts presentation titled The Nurtured Heart Approach, Positive Parenting and Teaching Strategies to Transform Problem Behaviors. Leading today's presentation is Howard Glasser. Howard is the creator of the Nurtured Heart Approach. He works in family treatment, clinical studies, and educational leadership. His formal studies, along with direct experience with the most intense and challenging children, form the basis of his approach. He's been referred to as one of the most influential people working to reduce children's reliance on psychiatric medications. Howard is the author of 15 books, including Transforming the Difficult Child, a longstanding bestseller on intense and challenging children. He teaches Nurtured Heart Approach Certification Training Intensives at the Nurtured Heart Institute, the University of Arizona's Integrative Medicine Program, and the Zuckerman School of Public Health. In today's webinar, we will talk about why conventional methods of behavior mod modification don't always work. Our children have so much to offer, they need the right structures in place to support them. The Nurtured Heart Approach helps all children develop great qualities of character and leadership. We'd like to begin today's webinar by asking our participants to answer a poll question. Which of the following discipline strategies is the most consistently effective for your child? Please answer and you'll see the poll results when you submit your response. And we are also interested, if you can tell us in the text box under the player, we want to know what is the best or the worst piece of advice that you have ever received for parenting or teaching a child with ADHD. So while you do that, um, I'll take care of a little housekeeping. Um, live participants, you can use that chat box at any time to submit a question. Uh, you can download the slides by clicking on the event resources section of your webinar screen and look for information about a certificate of attendance option in an email that you will receive about an hour after we wrap up the live broadcast. Also, we will make available a transcript of today's event in the coming week. If you're listening in replay or podcast mode, just visit attitudemag.com. Search for podcast 448 to access the slides, webinar replay, certificate of attendance, and webinar transcript. If you support the work we're doing here at Attitude, we encourage you to visit attitudemag.com slash subscribe and sign up for Attitude Magazine for your family or to share with a teacher or a loved one who could benefit from greater ADHD understanding. So without any further ado, I'm so pleased to welcome Howard Glasser. Thank you so much for joining us today and for leading this really interesting discussion. Uh, hi, it's so good to be here. Uh, I can't tell you um, how happy I am to uh, join the cause with you all at Attitude Magazine. Um, a year, I've I've uh, been a long-standing fan and admirer of your work. So thank you for all you do. Um, I will jump in with two feet. Uh, you know, I was thinking this morning. You know, if I had a video uh, of uh, uh, I, there is a video in existence of a two-year-old who's a double amputee who's learning to walk first steps. And it's a very short video. The first 15 seconds of the video, he's going, oh, no, oh, geez. He's using a walker, and he's being encouraged uh, by a, a parent and a physical therapist and he's saying to himself out loud, oh, geez, oh, no, oh, geez, oh, no. He's struggling with these first steps using a walker. And then somewhere along the line, uh, one of the workers says, one of the adults says, you got it. And he goes, I got it. And his next 
20 steps in the next 15 seconds are guided by, I got it, I got it, I got it. And he, and, and that's how it fades off in, 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 and then I ask people to imagine they had a search engine and can you Google this child's greatness? And there is zero interference with being able to blurt out. If we were doing that now, you'd be blurting out his sense of humor, his, his uplifting self-empowerment, his his um, beautiful determination, his, his et cetera. We'd have all these wonderful terms. And you could, you know, if determination was an umbrella, what would it take to be determined? And, you know, his courage, his verve, his self-kindness. Um, these are all great qualities. So I'm going to move into this slide that we see in front of us. We... You know, uh, we live on a planet of 8 billion people, whether we like it or not. You know, there's mathematically about 200,000 people a day who pass away. And if you could imagine of those, uh, a great many have memorial services. If you've ever attended a memorial service, you know that in the majority of cases, people are lined up at microphones and they're, you know, raring to go. And they don't just say, good job. <laughs> they don't just say, thank you. They are um, very explicit. You know, they said, you know, this man had such a great sense of humor. And they tell a story. And this person had, you know, here's a quality not too many people know about how compassionate he was. And they have a story. And how many of those people have ever heard a single word about their greatness while they're alive? And, you know, so we, we're great at speaking to somebody's greatness after the fact. Can we create a new diagnostic category. This is what I'm fighting for. Early onset greatness. You know, where, where it's not the kind that creates the grandiose person. That's actually a lack of, of exposure to appreciation. I'm talking about the truthful kind of appreciation that's not BS, that we can bring to anyone, to ourselves, to others, but mo maybe most importantly, in light of this discussion, to the children in our midst. And I believe we have that superpower, and that's a game changer. So, you know, we're here because of ADD and ADHD. You know, I am never going to question symptoms existing, but we all know that symptoms tend to get labeled. We know that symptoms can be distressing and worrisome and frustrating. And we can witness over and over again how symptoms like hyperactivity, impulsivity, inattentiveness, et cetera, the favored few, get labeled as pathology. I'm a little concerned because you know, pathology diagnosis follows a person for a long time. And to me, the meta message to a child is something's wrong with you because of your intensity. We can't handle it. You can't handle it. No one can handle it. We need to make it go away. And then before we know it, you know, um, if we're not careful, you know, uh, we can be spun into a realm of medication. It's still best practices. So all of you who who take on all kinds of other uh, possibilities, um, I applaud you. Um, and no doubt medications could give the appearance of moderating the intensity, but is that really what we want? Is that what we ever want? If you've ever raised your voice in frustration to a child, um, it's only because you believe there's more there. You believe that underneath the uh, the intensity going awry is 
the possibility that this child will rise to the occasion and use their intensity well. And I think that's what people have wanted to create all the while. I, I, uh, I'm convinced that um, that greatness is, uh, that intensity is the very fuel, the same intensity that drives us crazy is the very fuel of a child's greatness. And that we could start seeing into uh, what, the truth of a moment and call kids out in appreciation of, of really what is greatness. For instance, nobody's blurting anything out right now. Nobody is cussing or swearing or, or badgering me. Uh, how not great would any of that be? So therefore, the truth is you are, in fact, exercising your wisdom and your power and you're great. Those are great qualities that I'm experiencing in you right now. So, so we can we could dance into a uh, and dance with another person into a realm of greatness. You know, it it almost doesn't matter why we spin our wheels wondering why a child's uh, intense. Some kids are born with intensity. Some kids uh, acquire intensity because of stressors in their life, in their family, in their neighborhood. I am my, what I have found over and over again is the same dang intensity that creates worries and fears and frustration is the very fuel of a child's greatness. And that we already have the superpower to transform that. That's what we wanted. We don't want to blight it out or throw a blanket over it. We want to, uh, what we've wanted all along is to transform that very same intensity into a wonderful new way of acting out in the world. And I feel the secret sauce is inner wealth. We can build inner wealth. So I, I, my favorite way of explaining the nurtured heart approach from the inside out is to tell a few fa simple stories. And um, I'm just going to move right into it since there's, uh, we want to save as much time for question and answer at the end. And, um, and I want to give you as much as I can of this work um, in, in, in this brief seminar portion. Uh, so what if, I'm just going to say something preposterous. What if we were our kids' favorite toys? Think about how kids are when they get a new toy. They rarely will turn it away. They'll, you know, tear open the packaging and they'll explore it. And they'll, uh, you know, go into discovery mode and see what the features are. And some features are hopefully going to be worth, you know, uh, what we paid for the toy. And, um, and they're going to basically glom on to the features that entertain them and, and uh, they find fascinating. And, you know, most toys have so many features these days and some features are going to be relatively boring to any given child. And if you've ever watched that carefully, they may come across a boring feature and slough it off, but you know they may go back to that same feature by accident, or they may go back on purpose to see if it is indeed boring each and every time. But once they determine it's boring, they gonna go, and eh, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I'm not gonna go there." Um, and and they stick to the features that entertain them. Think about us as toys for a second. How many features do we have? We can not only uh, do, a, you know, like a wild variety of things in our actions and our physicality. Um, we have other additional components of what we think, of what we feel. Um, you know, it, it's not just happy, glad, sad, limited version. You know, uh, 
every given person who's on this call today may have already had 15 instances of, uh, of, of excitement or frustration. And you're not the same person on any given day. We're never the same person, uh, you know, um, moment to moment, you know, so we may have an infinite variety of frustration and excitement and anger and this and that. We're like the ultimate entertainment center. We're like the ultimate toy and maybe remote control included. So hang on to that for a second. Think of a kid who's merely got more intensity than the next kid, who's merely in a home or a classroom that's governed by normal conventional approaches. And I'll show you a kid who's likely to look at this toy, us, and discern that these toys are so much more interesting when things are going wrong compared to our pale responses when things are going right. When things are going right, we might say, good job, or way to go, or thank you. Those are well-intended statements, but they're basically vague. We don't know what they mean, as opposed to how explicit, how poetic we get when things go wrong. We have this unending way of explaining you know, negativity. And we unintentionally show kids that they get more out of life through negativity. Kids form that energetic impression. And uh, I would contend that um, that is, um, you know, if this toy, us, is more animated, compelling, alive, and energizing when things are going wrong, that that gets translated and transmitted. Kids put two and two together that they are more valued, more meaningful, more loved vis-a-vis -vis negativity. And they wind up replicating it. And, you know, the, you know, uh, the staff and I uh, realized at some point that, you know, this is not Zoom and my videos won't play. So I'm going to describe what this video is. This is a very young man named Reed who's, um, you know, his mom's in the background and he's, he doesn't walk without assistance yet. He's walk, he's toddling his way around a living room table with his mom in the background and there's a glass of water on the table and his mom's going, read, no, no. And she's just got normal, conventional, traditional parenting. And she's trying to set a limit. And he's looking at her and looking at the glass. And she is ramping up her word no, her volume, the magnitude, the vibration of the word no. And he gets around to the other side of the table. And he's looking at the glass and looking at mom. And mom continues to say no. And he forms a smile on his face and he goes, oh, I get it. I can fake mom out. I can get her goat and I get a greater gift of mom. I'm getting more plugged in. I'm getting better broadband. He, in effect, is discovering, you know, he doesn't like dial up. He wants better broadband and he's getting better connectivity when he plays the game of going negative, he gets more volume out of mom. He's getting a greater gift of her. She wouldn't dream of giving him a hundred dollar bill by you know for for doing the wrong thing. Nobody would, but accidentally, that's what she's doing energetically, giving that hundred dollar bill. So now, another story is a video game. So. Um, we all know that there are a lot of kids out there who love their video games. And it creates, uh, you know, I'm not a fan, forgive me, of video games just because of the insanity of how violent they are and how, um, you know, um, 
you know, just the the outer trappings of the video games. But I'm utterly aware that while kids are playing video games, they're under the impression they could go level, 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 level of attainment and mastery, and they're living their greatness. So let me dissect that. At some point, I had parents asking me, why can my kid concentrate endlessly at a video game, but they can't concentrate for minutes when it comes to chores, responsibilities, assignments, anything like that? And, and here's what came out of that, is um, I realized that video games have a structure to them that inducts a child into seeing that they can live their time through the video game in great ways. They could experience their greatness. So I'll be the kid for a second. Here I am at the moment playing one of these games, going currently going towards the goals, occasionally getting the goals. And while that's happening, the game's in my face, confronting me with my successfulness energetically Score, 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 bells and whistles alerting me to successfulness. And at any given second, I'm free to break a rule. The game never says don't break a rule. It allows me to break a rule. But when I do, I get bumped from the game. It never goes, oh, poor Howie, he's having a bad day. Let's let this one go or let's give him a warning or or he's having a good day. Let's not break the momentum. It always delivers, and we look at these consequences and we think they're drastic and punitive, but actually, who's back in the game in two seconds? So the game has this marvelous way of enforcing rules, like in sports, a toe on the line is a toe on the line, but a toe not on the line is a toe not on the line, and that's success. Like, like for instance, a child looks like they're about to flare up and 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 argue but um there are these moments when before that happens or if it doesn't happen where we have the ability and the superpower to enter into that and say i like what just happened i need to tell you about this what you just did is handle your strong feelings well you didn't like getting told no to a privilege you wanted and i could see you were flaring up, but you didn't argue, you didn't yell, you didn't say, blurt out any bad words, you didn't name call, you used your power, your wisdom. Those are great qualities I see in you. So like in the video game, the video game uh, had, it, it is, you know, and when kids break a rule, they're back in the game in two seconds and they don't come back in the same old way. They come back rededicated to not only not breaking that rule, but not breaking every other rule and going level, 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 which is code for greatness. These games have a logic that uh, makes sense to kids. And we can translate that same logic into home and school. You know, the, uh, the incentives are strong and predictable. The rules are clear and predictable, and the 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 venue, the uh, the avenue it creates confronts a child with their successfulness. It always delivers a consequence. A rule's broken a hair. It it delivers a consequence, but it's a very different kind of consequence. It's it's very incidental. It's just a pause in the action, and um, and the, the, it never holds a grudge. It then inducts the child back into successfulness. So that's kind of what I'm getting at. The, the timing is always right. The payoffs are an upside down, like in, like I was talking about with the, um, earlier with the mom and the, uh, the, the glass with water on the table. The payoffs aren't upside down, they're right side up. Um, I believe in my work, my clinical work has shown me over and over again with the same structure, this is the good news, with the same structure, 
kids can play life with the same zeal and accomplishment as they do in video games. It's the structure that helps them. And maybe the great news is from this point of view, there's no blame. You know, it, it's, it's not the fault of the child or the parent or the teacher, what the, um, the fault line lies with the methods we have at our disposal, the methods that come along. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick to the flavor of this and give you another story, um, which is of I was setting up to do an in-service at a school, and uh, what I didn't realize is it was going to be in the school library, and there was a class uh, that was going on during the last period of the day. And there were two adult librarians in the front of the room, and there were kids like we're seeing here at tables working somewhat collaboratively, somewhat independently. And all was great. For the first 10 minutes, I'm minding my own business. I'm in a section of the library that's cordoned off by bookshelves. And uh, the kids aren't even aware of me. Uh, but I could see through the bookshelves to the bigger part of the library. And, and here, you know, the kids are doing what they're supposed to do. And all of a sudden, there's something that happens at a table. It was so, it was so incidental that I didn't even know who had done it or where it had occurred. But I saw one of the adults uh, stand up and make her way over to a table. And the first thought I had was, wow, uh, she looks like a kind and loving person. And in keeping with that in a kind and loving way, she makes her way over to a kid and she motions for him to come over and he, uh, she puts her arm around him in a kind and loving way and begins chatting with him in a kind and loving way. And she moves him over to the side of the room where I am. They don't realize I'm there 10 feet away, but I could hear them now. And she's saying, Alex, I want you to be careful not to distract anybody else or get distracted. This is a really important assignment. And uh, a lot of your grade depends on it. The same is true for the other kids. And two minutes of chit chat in a very kind and loving way, she sends him back to his table and, um, and uh, pats him on the back, kind and loving. And uh, she goes to the front of the room. And this is the crazy part. Within the next few minutes, it's havoc in the room. And I'm watching, it's like mutiny. And I'm watching this, and my first thought was having, I know New York City well. I drove cab through to work my way through graduate school. My first crazy thought was she should work on Madison Avenue and be in the advertising industry. She could be making a fortune with her brilliance. Question is, what was she advertising? What was she marketing? She was marketing that you all are invisible when things are going right, but when you do something wrong, I show up with my kind lovingness. I don't want her to stop being kind and loving. I just want her to get the timing right, like in the video game. I want her to bring her kind lovingness to when things are going well, uh, when things aren't going wrong. That's the time to give um, the kind lovingness. So again, there's no blame. It's not the parent, the teacher, or the child who's the problem. It's simply the methods we've had at our disposal. And when you have a method that's energetically aligned, like I'm alluding to, then everything changes. I think every kid who was feeling any bit of neediness in that classroom in the library, um, they started acting out because that was the writing on the wall. Act out and you get the kind, loving human being to connect with. They're going to plug in and they're going to give the gift to them. So um, what I'm getting at is um, conventional methods, traditional Normal approaches are not a good fit.
for intensity. They backfire often. The harder we try with normal approaches, the more we wind up inadvertently giving the gift of us for negativity. And um, yes, Nurture Heart Approach has this namby-pamby name, but it's actually a warrior approach. It's actually truth-based. I'm looking for the absolute truth of the moment, and I'm looking when rules are broken, I have a way of approaching that that's very uh, much in keeping with the video game. And when rules aren't broken, when it looks even that it looks like a rule isn't being, it looks like it might be broken because of something that's stirring in the room, I'm trying as hard as I can to see the beauty of rules not being broken and the greatness inherent in that. Um, so it questions the relationship, the energy of relationship. That's what Nurtured Heart Approach is about. So there's core, three core pieces that I'm going to briefly mention. One is um, that, uh, you know, stand one is absolutely no. I'm not going to give the gift of me to that. I'm not going to give energy, connection, relationship to negativity. Second stand, and we got to establish that first. We can't just say, hey, kids, I'm not giving energy to negativity anymore. We got to be that. I write about that a lot. The second stand is absolutely yes. Here's what I am going to give my relationship to. When the rules aren't being broken, when the moment's right, I'm going to do, I am going to do that. I'm going to give myself generously to that and absolutely clear when a rule's broken, it's broken. And I'm going to have a very deliberate stance on that. I, I do have rules that pertain to my boundaries and to the boundaries of this classroom of this house. Um, so I want to make sure I didn't miss anything. Um, so, uh, okay, there we go. That's the next slide. So briefly, stand one is I refuse to give the gift of me to negativity. It's a refusal. I won't reward negativity with my energy connection relationship. So here's another video that won't play, unfortunately. It's funny. Um, it shows a conventional attempt of, on the part of a family to ignore a kid, he, clearly a devotee of tantruming. This kid is a couple of years old. He, he, he clearly has established this belief that if, he, if he's upset about something and he tantrums, if he tantrums enough, he's going to get um, people to come his way and get relationships. And so this family, over and over, is ignoring him by walking away. And as soon as he they've walked away enough, he stands up and he walks following them, and then he throws himself down on the ground again with a tantrum. So he gets his act together very quickly, goes to the next place of tantruming, and he tantrums harder. And then they walk away again without saying a word. But this keeps going around. And it's not going to stop anytime soon. I don't think normal ignoring actually works. To me, an intense kid is going to get inspired to tantrum harder. And to see if there's any other additional things he could add on. So he's going to get more creative in tantruming So because he, he believes there's nothing that's come along that's changed the belief that he gets more in a life through negativity. So what I think we could do differently is he tantrums. We have a rule, no tantruming, no meltdowns, no yelling, whatever rule we have. As the mom, the family is walking away, they say reset. Unceremoniously, as free of energy as they can, they just simply say reset. They walk away, but they they remain poised 
to when he stops tantruming and then they turn back, like in the video game, this is very akin to the video game, they turn back and say, thank you for resetting, your reset, your consequence is over. I want him to believe that's a kids in a video game have this illusion they've had a consequence. And that's game in, game on is so powerful. The game out, game off is so powerful. And even a two second, two seconds of a consequence is monumental. It feels like an eternity and it has power. That's what people want in a consequence. So silently, the, the, the parent unplugs when they say reset, then they they realize the rules no longer being broken. They turn back and say, thank you for doing your reset. They plug back in. Now you may still be mad at me and you, you feel tempted to melt down, but you aren't. Right now, you are, you are not throwing a tantrum. You're using your kindness. You're using your caring. You're being responsible. You're handling your strong feelings well. This is the gear I want to build up, inner wealth inner wealth, inner wealth. I've seen so much good come out of inner wealth. So um, I, was, I was explaining this all to a family. I'm almost at the end of my presentation. I was explaining this all to a family and I was talking about this reset concept and they had a, a young child who appeared, they were worried, these are two smart people, parents, who were worried that their child was on the spectrum because he didn't use any words. He just melt down. He would, he had this wild repertoire of ways of melting down and they believed in unconditional love, which is a beautiful thing. And when he melted down, they would pick him up and hug him. And, and uh, they were done with that. And of course they were concerned about this child being on the spectrum. So um, he hadn't spoken any words in his lifetime. So I happened to be in their home doing a session. And uh, um, they, I was explaining all this, and they looked at me funny, and they didn't know really what I meant by, um, you know, I said, are you willing to have rules pertaining to his whining and fussing? And they said, yes, are you willing to, to compliment him? with deep appreciation, see the beauty and greatness in him when he's not whining. Yes, I would. They, they agreed to do that. Are you willing to hold him accountable when he whines? And uh, I simply want you to do a reset. I explained that. And they, they still didn't get it. And there was a toaster on the counter. And I said, imagine that toaster, this fancy ass toaster on your counter is the best toaster ever, ever, ever. It, it, it it's intuitive. It knows how to make your bread differently every day. It, it bakes the bread. It harvests the wheat. It makes your coffee. It it it's all prepared perfectly, timed to when you are ready for it. It knows when you're waking up. Um, that toaster, when it's plugged in, does everything as promised. When it's not plugged in, it's still the best toaster ever. It just simply won't work. You're the toaster. And all of a sudden, it clicked in for them. And to their credit, they held true to what I've just spoken briefly about, also ever so briefly about, and they got it. And um, I was around for uh, the, a few days to come. I had a bunch of sessions with them. And I watched how this young man progressed over the next few days. And within a week, this kid had a whole vocabulary of words. He didn't need words. He had whining. Whining worked for him. That was his language. And all of a sudden, when whining didn't work any longer, and he was being grown in his inner wealth deliberately, all of a sudden, he started functioning in these wonderful ways. He was using the same intensity that was going awry to, in support of his greatness. And that's what nurture.
art is all about. Um, it's about transformation. There's no longer anything to be gained by breaking the rules. The big responses are now only for the positive. Breaking a rule only gets a true consequence, not a payoff. That's the essence of Nurtured Heart Approach. So uh, I believe I'm right spot on in my timing. Hallelujah. Um, I, I will tell you that for all those on this webinar, I can't tell how many people are here, but um, I, I am thrilled that, uh, that you are here because of your desire uh, in looking how to be your best self in relation to the kids who inspire you to be here. And on behalf of them, you're serving them and your, um, your desire to be agents of change and transformational is what I'm admiring right now. You are the greatness of transformation, and I appreciate you. And I'll turn it back to our crew, um, the staff of Attitude Magazine, to carry it the rest of the way and ask, you know, um, interface on the questions. Wonderful. Howard, thank you so much for that presentation and, and your segue was perfect because um, I've been reading over some of the answers that our attendees submitted at the beginning here about um, the best parenting advice that they've ever received. And I believe wholeheartedly that some of the best solutions and ideas and inspiration come from the community. So I wanted to share just a few of those. Um, the one, um, Attendee wrote in the best advice they received was to treat their child as a competent human being and provide supports for their challenges. Another one wrote what, uh, similarly, to treat your kids like little people, engage them in the process. And someone else wrote in that the best advice they have um, received was to work on the connection, prioritizing their <clears throat> connection with their child has changed their whole household. So. Um, thank you, everyone, for submitting those insights from from the <laughs> from the trenches, if you will. Um, and I will get into the questions. We had a number of people responding um, to the reset and wondering what advice you might offer for um, a child who is, for example, um, hurting themselves or others. Hmm. or swearing at the parent or swearing at others um, is a reset a um, you know a, a, <laughs> is that response going to be enough um, and is, is it have enough amplitude is it yes. have enough is it drastic and punitive enough that's you know, pretty much it yes <laughs> you know we 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 re we need to realize we live in a world we're immersed we're surrounded in a world that <clears throat> has historically held the belief, if only we come down hard enough, a child's going to come to their senses. They're going to wake up and smell the coffee. And if, if only we, there, there have been whole schools of consequences, of response, that have believed that we have to have a commensurate, is that a good word, Carly? Um, we have to have a, you know, an equivalency in terms of consequences that um, that correspond in that e equivalent way. And I, I'm I'm here to say that I've actually worked in the opposite direction. I've wanted consequences to be less as least drastic as possible. You know, if you if you probably, you know, unfortunately, for better or worse, you know, my original copies of not of night from 1999 of Transforming the Difficult Child before it was revised half a dozen times at least, you know, um, the, I, I knew that someday I'd have a consequence that had less energy to it. But still back then, the timeouts I used had energy to it. And um, what I've tried to do is decrease that over time, actually. I've, I've worked with 
I don't know how to convey this without asking for your trust, but, you know, when you've been successful with ADHD kids um, and other difficult oppositional kids, your practice starts brimming with those referrals. I can't tell you how many times I've had the supposedly worst kid ever. Um, and even from not only in Arizona, Tucson, where I live, but from other states, you know, your reputation gets out there. And uh, I, I'm telling you the most powerful way to go, even when there's talking back and bad words and, and all these otherwise upending things that we think we have to come down hard on, you know, the best way is, one, get ahead of it when the problem isn't happening, really go to town in, in appreciating that the problem isn't happening. Hey, guys, I just I've been on the phone for 15 minutes and I'm just taking a break and got to get back on the phone. But I got to tell you, you're you are you've been playing together well and I haven't heard any arguing. I haven't heard any shouting. I haven't heard any bad words. That shows me your wisdom. That shows me your self-control. That shows me your power. That um, I, I'm looking around the room right now and there's no destruction. It doesn't look like a tornado has gone through the room. I like being utterly truthful and brash in making my compliments and making them full on. And, and by the way, guys, before I leave, those are great qualities I see in you. I want to speak to kids at a soul level. I want to stir them and inspire them on a soul level. And that's where the word greatness really serves the cause. And so that's one end of the continuum. The second is I don't want when a problem happens, such as you're describing, I don't want I might be upended inside, but I'm going to take I'm going to channel what intensity is stirring in me and I'm going to put it into um, building my reservoir of being calm in the face of that. And I am going to just say to the child, reset. I am going to unplug and I am going to be that much more attuned to when the problem is no longer happening. And that's where I want to build inner wealth, build inner wealth, build inner wealth, you know, create that memorial service, you know, mm -hmm. early onset greatness. I'll stop there. <laughs> Um, we do have a number of parents of teenagers and as, as um, any, the exception. <laughs> any, any parent of a teenager knows that adolescence, um, is a challenging time for all involved. And a common challenge is, um, lack of acceptance of responsibility. Everything is, you know, someone else's fault and a lot of resistance. So parents are wondering, do they need to modify this approach for their teenager when the response is usually an eye roll or worse? Yeah. You know, I think uh, this is yet again another incredibly important question, as was the first. Um, I would say yes. The modification, though, might surprise you. I would, in the face of that, it's, it's like, imagine me going home today and I have a teenager, and I start um, saying these very complimentary things to this child. And the child looks at me and goes, why are you saying this? That's dumb. You know, leave me alone. And, um, uh, you know, I, I, I say something else. And they say, what'd you do, take some stupid parenting class? And I'm going to go, yeah, I actually wow, you're very astute. You see through everything. Um, first of all, thank you for not, um, you know, uh, yelling and, and screaming. You just simply made an observation. And um, yeah, I, I, the class was about, you know, um, it, intensity. And I realized I tend, I tend to, my intensity tends to bring me to see what's wrong and be critical. And I decided I'm not going to do that anymore. It's silly. And, and, uh, and, um, 
weird and I could see it's weird for you too. And um, I decided I'm going to see you when things are going right. So maybe I'll get used to it. See you later. Maybe you'll get used to it. Um, uh, but, but I didn't just go away and run for the hills and abandon this. I actually dug in deeper. So uh, that's my advice to you is, yes, teens who, for the very reasons you're mentioning, and a whole bunch more, I feel like I got to work double time. And I am not going to let their, you know, off-putting statements, you know, leave me alone, go away, leave, don't say those weird things to me. I'm never going to let them stop me. I, 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 I am going to win. This is where I dig in and go, I'm, I'm, I, you know, they, they, thank you for offering your opinion. I don't see things the same way. You know, I am, I, this is what I decided I'm doing from now on. And I can't tell you how many stories I get coming my way now that I am an author and I have a lot of books out there and I have a platform on Facebook for Nurtured Heart Approach that people share stories of how they've affected their teens and older. Kids who are grown and out of the house where they've had monumental impact on, on their kids. And, and a lot of times it's taken cycling to next levels of digging in and being, you know, I'm going to fiercely live these three stands. Yes, I'm tempted to, you know, uh, you know, child doesn't want to take responsibility for something. I'm tempted to get mad at them. But I'm going to use that. I'm going to use the nectar of my own intensity to propel my next levels of greatness. So I'm going to show up even more with stand one, stand two, and stand three. It's as simple as that. Okay. We did have um, someone wrote in today to say that they had a teen who was in a crisis and rebellion when they were first using the nurtured heart approach. Um, and as they were beginning, they held off on consequences so that they could build this inner wealth. And she wrote, I was sure that her behavior would get worse without consequences. And the opposite mm. is what happened. She said, simply shifting our energetic connection transformed our relationship. Mm. So that's a... A, a powerful testimonial and you know i'll say you know i i i do i i do i do want to make that comment is when i had a clinical practice i would never teach even though people were desperate at first tell me what to do when my child does this i would never teach the consequence piece until i had stand one and two in place and that's what the comment you just read pertains to is they shifted their energetic connection, which is they're not giving, and one, not giving energy to negativity while choosing to be very deliberate to give. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's good. Good context. And I, I did want to mention, um, you know, the, the poll result from, from earlier, um, we asked uh, the people here, what discipline strategy has been most consistently um, effective. And I will say, you know, punishment came in second to last. Um, only mm. about 7% of people said that punishment was the most effective. Um, but on the flip side, um, they said redirection um, using distractions was, was number one. Of course, we don't know the ages of the children. So, right. um, and, and rewards, was number two. So um... well, I, I, let me comment on both of those. Those are that's a very. I'm so so glad that punishment was next to last. Uh, that represents a huge change from when I was raised. Um, you know, that's what we're doing. We're raising our children. Raising, you know, raising pertains to uplifting. Um, a redirection. I'm a little cautious about that because. You know, I watched, for instance, uh, I did a lot of work with Head Start 
for a period of time and redirection was one of their prime things. And the problem is it's hard to redirect without giving relationship to, to negativity. So in effect, you're looking the other way. A child knocks things over in the house, you know, in, in the, um, in the building block section and the, the teacher comes and sweeps the child away to another section of the room to play differently and gives them a few minutes of their time. I would much rather handle the transgression right there and then by saying reset. Um, and, and at some point the child stops doing the problem and then the game is on of now I want to jump all over that and take advantage of the moment where the problem isn't happening and use that to funnel into building a child's inner wealth and greatness. Uh, that's redirection. The other one you mentioned was, um, was uh, oh God, I, I'm blanking. You need, it, do you have it in front of you again, the poll? The second. Um, yes, the, the um, second most powerful was rewards. Reward. So I believe we're the greatest reward. It's not the M&M. &M. It's us. And once we begin taking advantage of all the moments when the problems aren't happening to do deeper, relevant character building appreciation, we begin to see that we're the prize. And it never was the M&M. &M at all, it was always the gift of us that makes all the difference in the world. And I like, I, I personally prefer unhinging that, that it's not the giving of things or taking of things, a threat of loss of things. You're not gonna have screen time if you don't behave. Th that to me is a dead end in the long run. And it, it leads to, it, it leads to more possible crisis in the long run. Not to say that that hasn't ever worked for anybody. I'm not questioning that. In the long run, that's uh, that runs out of gas. And what what's much more fulfilling is seeing that we're we're the ultimate reward. Mm -hmm. I wanted to. Um, ask one more question here in our remaining time, and that is for parents who are recognizing the power of consistency across households and households and school. Do you have advice for how parents could advocate for a, a nurtured heart approach at mm. school and, and work with teachers on a consistent? Yeah, first? that's really, really beautiful. And what a great question to end with is, um, is I've had this be an issue many, many times. So if I'm a parent and I have a difficult child and the school has informed me that my child's being difficult in school, um, at that moment in time, if I'm currently upended too, where, where I haven't transformed anything at home, I could say a million things to the school and have no effect. I have no voice until I have a voice. What I've seen over and over again that gives people the proper empowerment and the voice is they take on, whether it's my approach or somebody else's approach, they take on, in this instance, nurture heart approach. They get stand one, stand two in place. You know, eventually they get stand three in place when time's right. And they see that, at, you know, a month rolls by and they go, wow things have really changed and it's no accident. That's the point I'm fighting for, where parents go, it's no accident. It wasn't medication that's changing things. It wasn't anything else that's changing things. It's the deliberate difference I'm making by way of the approach. That's when all of a sudden you could visit the school and say, by the way, we've had this transformation at home and here's what we're doing. That's when mm -hmm. you could hand them one of the books that pertain to, you know, school. I have a few and, or you could just say, you know, let me explain, you know, uh, the, you know, I do these trainings 
you know, I do these week long trainings so other people can teach this approach. I do these certification intensives, but in effect, I spoke for 30 minutes today or 35 minutes and I gave you the very, the very skimpiest skinny on this approach. It can be conveyed in, in five minutes if that's all you have. Um, you know, I, I, believe that's the most effective way to bridge the gap to schools. And schools are looking for answers, too. Mm -hmm. uh, teachers are not prepared at the School of Education for the kinds of kids they're encountering. And, um, and it's their main reason for quitting the profession. We can't afford to lose teachers. And um, uh, they need answers as much as anybody on the planet. And they it it creates it brings them from an, a a marginal career to a very gratifying career to see they could not only um, convey academics but they could really change and build character. Wonderful. Well, Howard, thank you so much for today's um, presentation and contributing your voice and insight to our attitude community. Um, we hope that all of you who are listening today will join us for future Attitude webinars. Next week, we have a webinar with Dr. Don Brown on how to leverage sports psychology to benefit ADHD brains. We hope you can join us for that and make sure you don't miss any upcoming uh, webinars by getting alerts. Um, you can sign up at attitudemag.com slash newsletters. In the meantime, Howard, thank you so much once again, and thanks for everyone uh, who joined us today. My pleasure.